lovely to see you again. Um, uh, look like you're thriving in lockdown, and uh, you, you, uh, you just told us that you've been doing the stairs. I've been doing the stairs. I'm trying to put breaks between Zoom meetings and go outside and either do one with audio only, uh, but okay. keep the body moving. And I'm probably in better shape in lockdown than not. So, so just saying, can you can you stay online until we finish this before you go and do any <laughs> stairs? Is that okay? I, I will. Although I got I have my runners on, so. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right. So, well. Ew. Say we decide to have a break halfway through. We can all go and do some stairs, and we can come back. Okay. How's that? Sounds good. <laughs> Never mind. Good, 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 good. So um, more serious topic, uh, Trevor. We're here to talk about cybercrime and cybersecurity. As you know, we're doing a series of uh, podcasts. We've had wonderful contributions from, uh, from uh, Karen Girioni and from uh, Alistair McGibbon. Very keen to get your perspective because as CIO of the University of Sydney, you're there in the front line. You're the guy, presumably, who is the first man they call when something goes awry in the cybersecurity. If there's a breach or if there's a people think there's going to be a breach, you're the man who's going to get the first uh, phone call. Um, and also the person, I guess, who's expected to fix it. That's right. How's that going? Yeah, how do you feel about that? <laughs> well, there was an old joke in the 1990s that CIO stood for career is over because of so many failed uh, ERP implementations. And I think recently the uh, career is over takes a new a new um, perspective with, with cyber issues. Although probably the colliery is true, actually. Um, I think organizations look to hire senior people and CIOs and chief information security officers who have gone through it uh, because those are some good war wounds mm -hmm. to uh, to take. But um, yeah, it, it, I have never really lost sleep in my career over anything or situations, but uh, there have been some times in the last couple of years where um, just the threat of uh, the increased threat of uh, a cybersecurity issue has kept me up at night from time to time worrying about that. Yeah, I think you're blessed, though, with the Canadian DNA. So uh... It's of no surprise to any of us that you're pretty chilled out and relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, so look, um, we're, we're, we're um, trying to focus on a number of different areas here and uh, keen to get your perspective. You know, we talked about this kind of frontline role you've got um, and being in a university environment, um, you know, the, the kind of a threat surface that you've got, the attack surface you've got is is exponentially higher than a lot of organizations that we talk to how do you how do you um how do you address that yeah that's really one of the reasons for um losing sleep is because universities are very diverse and fragmented i mean the very word university means unity and diversity although especially in larger research intensive universities they highlight the diversity versus the unity so you have huge amount of fragmented uh business areas running their own systems uh, and universities that have tried to get on the front foot of this in the last few years have tried to consolidate all of their core IT activities into one place. And the ones that are doing it really well are centralizing the whole stack into one area, uh, not just the infrastructure around the servers and so on, but all the way up to application configuration and so on, because it's really that whole stack where you can be vulnerable. And there's it only takes one vulnerability and it could be a technology misconfiguration, it could be uh, an old piece of technology that's not patched, it could be someone configuring um, access to private data that accidentally shares it out with anyone who has the URL or those sorts of things. So it's not just a technology problem where a lot of these, um, these issues can come into play. And to what extent do, um, I guess, users have a role to play in being a bit of a, not necessarily the cause of the problem, but a channel of the problem, I suppose. That's right. Um, and how, do you, how do you go about, um, I guess, educating or making everyone aware of how to be more aware of it, of the yeah. risks? So I think uh, taking a holistic long-term approach to that is really key. Um, and I'll use an example here around uh, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. The reality is we want everybody who participates in modern society and uses technology to think about security 
uh, cybersecurity in every aspect of their life. So long passwords or passphrases and different ones for every account, um, all the way to uh, multi-factor authentication. So in answering your question, Jason, it's really about, um, uh, for example, at an organization, a company, or in this case, the University of Sydney, when we roll out something like multi-factor authentication for the university accounts, trying to get people to understand why it's there, but then also make the suggestion and provide links to say, in your personal life, in your Twitter account, in your mm. Facebook account, on your iCloud account with Apple, you should turn these things on as well. And so it's more about taking a macro um, view that if people take increasingly personal responsibility for securing themselves online, that'll actually help in their behaviors in the organization they're working with as well. And, and it sort of goes back and forth. But there's really a long way to go, I think, for the average worker the average person to realize person, how yeah. much mm. they really need to think about this and what they yeah. should be doing. So, so how long have you been at uh, University of Sydney now? Is it two years? Coming up two years on my two birthday years. at the end of the month. Yeah. yeah. So um, not not wishing to be disparaging about your uh, uh, the person you replaced or the organization that you replaced, but um, obviously you've taken measures in the last two years to try and improve uh, the the footprint in in terms of your ability to respond to these risks. Do you think you're winning? It's a dangerous thing to say for a variety of reasons, including <laughs> tempting people to uh, to have a go at us. But um, yeah. certainly we are. Our risk posture from a couple of years ago uh, is is much better. Um, the risk is lower now. That has to be understood in a, a changing context as well, because the reality is that the threat landscape is getting worse out there as well. So mm -hmm. while we're trying to play catch up with things, the reality is things are getting worse and there's more zero day exploits and various other things going on. But by and large, um, we're doing really well. And I'll just give a couple of examples. When you're dealing with an organization that's highly fragmented with dated technology uh, and lots of devolved responsibility for it, um, one of the best things you can do is in the short term, um, put together a really good detect and respond capability. So it's sort of you know put inside a hard outer shell to protect the soft inside because you're not going to fix the soft inside in weeks or months. It's going to take years. And so that investment um, that we made and it predated me coming in and we've just doubled down on it has been very good because you can stop things very early and prevent them um, from really taking taking a hold on you. But speaking about the, the soft inside, we've done a lot to remediate that. And it's everything from getting better idea of who's running what out there and getting them to consolidate and move their technology into the central IT group. And then we can work through that. Um, and sometimes that takes time. So it's about telling somebody, hey, you haven't patched your systems. We're giving you 24 hours notice to do it and uh, kind of putting our foot down and being firm with people to do that, which to my surprise has been well received by people uh, just by by being clear, being firm that you must do this. Um, you're running your own technology now. But one of the other big things that we did um, just at the early part of this year was roll out multi-factor authentication to all users. So anyone who logs into a university single sign-on system, whether it's a staff or a future student or an alumni or others, um, will have to have uh, multi-factor authentication working. And uh, it's over 100,000 accounts. Um, most systems wow. now are protected by that. And we're, there's a few fringe systems that are probably uh, low risk and, and low number of users that we're moving into that single sign-on. But, but I sort of bookend those two things because that respond, uh, detect and respond capability, some of the other activities under the covers around technology, but then user facing, uh, putting multi-factor authentication in. And that really protects us against those big nation state um, attacks in a, much, in a much better way because you almost need to have access to the device. So you'd have to be in Sydney or where that uh, particular student is in order to, mm -hmm. uh, to get in. So when we were talking to Alison McGibbon earlier, um, he talked about this, this issue of entropy and legacy systems. Um, I'm guessing that as a university, 
you've got a lot of legacy systems, or had. I don't know if you've replaced them all yet. Um, and they're a massive, massive vulnerability because when those systems were built, you know, cybersecurity wasn't even a thing. It is, and that's part of um, uh, doing uh, what you can with what you have right now is a, is a, a phrase that I really like. Um, because a lot of the times the approaching a problem inside an organization, whether it's technology, cybersecurity or others, people love to come up with the perfect plan and the perfect plan will never execute. And it certainly won't execute within um, the days or weeks that you need it to. It's usually months. So um, there's an example where um, you just try and find ways to mitigate the risk or reduce the risk. And I'll give you one example. There was a, there was a core system that the university had years ago it was a custom built thing um, it was replaced 10 years ago with something new although that, that's not so new anymore either but i found out last year that the system was still running and the reason it was still running is because the project um, kind of ended without being able to fully decommission the system and there's data on that system that sometimes has to be referenced every week so what we did uh, was a practical compromise we said um, we're going to turn this, we're, we're, first of all, we're going to isolate the system. So it'll only be accessible inside a room and it will be off except for three hours every fortnight. And so <laughs> requests come in for data and they build up over the fortnight. A person who has access to the room boots the system and we hope that the hard drives hold and they, they boot up. They access the data that they need and then we shut it down. So it's not perfect. In an ideal world, we would have that data moved and migrated and fully turned off but you know it sort of goes with another saying i like which is if it's stupid and it's and it works it's not stupid and yeah. you know this is a cost effective way to manage right now when we probably have bigger issues that we need to throw our money at to to manage that's that's a beautiful sort of ritualistic way of dealing with the problem you know I can imagine people queuing up outside the door, you know, that, that 15 no, minutes, that you know, bad. access to <laughs> it, you know, we, I wonder what's going to, I wonder what's going to come out the next time we go in. <laughs> no, I know, but you know, people often, there's a word I learned at the University of Sydney, but, but the concept I learned much sooner in my career, and that's over catastrophizing. And, you know, things generally are never as bad as people say they're going to be. And so, this was an example where it was, you know, you can't turn that system down. You don't understand and this and that and the other thing. And in reality, once as a group, we worked through what really needed to happen, we were able to find a practical solution. So um, a lot of times with cybersecurity issues, it does, it does turn into something bigger than maybe is necessary to at least mitigate the risk in the short term. Yeah. Mm. Um. Yeah, that's in, I guess another thing that you guys have had to address or overcome is the whole, you know, COVID and working and learning, I suppose, from home. Um, and meaning that everyone is obviously accessing um, your systems from private, um, you know, or sorry, public networks. Um, how, have yep. you, how have you navigated that? Yeah, lots it's obviously of... Huge risk. Um, lots of the same approach. So very quickly realizing there's things that we didn't do that we need to do uh, and mm -hmm. put those things in place. So an example of that uh, is our managed computers for work computers before you had to be on one of our campuses connected to our network yeah. or connected through the VPN. And we yeah. found very quickly, actually, that's, that's not going to work. So we pivoted to a different kind of management tool that we were able to um, just use over the public internet to keep things like uh, system patches installed mm. and security patches and those sorts of things, definitions for antivirus and so on, mm. keeping pace. Um, but the other thing is, you know, people, like you said, they're using personal computers uh, to access things and maybe those aren't terribly secure. Um, the reality though is um, if anything, people working from home with COVID hasn't created that problem it was already there it just might be slightly larger right. now um, and that's another thing that i think is important is realizing um, is this a new problem uh, or was it an old problem and that doesn't mean you shouldn't address it but it's helpful for context to realize um, you know just what what it is you're dealing with um, so we were able to put some other measures in place and everything from user training to um, 
um, accessing cloud services where it might not be as big a deal to have an insecure PC. So um, now it's an, a, a bit of a, a grand statement. It, it doesn't work in all cases, but um, you know when you go log into a web page and you're able to navigate and do things through a web page uh, around a SaaS solution, that's much better than having to install an application yeah. on an outdated operating system that introduces um, far more vulnerabilities. Yeah, mm. I'm, I'm sure that, um, y yeah, the university is a lot more stringent about these types of things than um, a standard organization, but uh, the u like speaking of tools and different SaaS solutions or products, um, like IT, uh, sorry, shadowing IT uh, technology. So, well, tools, so um, I imagine there's a lot more people using different products to solve different problems. And it's probably a question that's probably outside of your organization. But um, what's the question there? Really, is it, what is the, because it's essentially opening up um, risk or the opportunity for data to be shared through um, tools that have not really been verified and anything could really be installed on these things and, and That's right. data or whatever it might be from those. Um, yeah. Do you think that has a, you know, I guess it's a question around having a level of governance around that, but at the same time, giving people freedom to get stuff done in a way that works for them? Yeah. Um, look, I think I have a bit of a contrarian view on this uh, to at least some of, of my colleagues. Um, I don't think IT should be enabling IT-like things to be done by others. Um, so if you think about um, back into the 90s, um, and if people can't do that, just use your imagination. Um, you know, we sort of went from this mainframe computing idea to, to, to democratize commute, computing. There's lots of good things about that. It was basically, you know, go and buy your computer and set it up on your own. And, and then, and then so you get lots of fragmentation. You get different kinds of technologies in the organization. There's issues around compatibility. Um, people are buying their own software, like you said, doing their own things. And we sort of, you know, then the industry responded and said, actually, we need to control this. We need some standards. Everyone needs to use a certain version. And we put yeah. management tools in and, and so on. And so what we're seeing in, in terms of modern technologies in the last five to 10 years, where it's really the commoditization of a lot of tools um, where you don't have to know too much as a business uh, person to, to help yourself and do things mm -hmm. with technology. But the issue with that is it just moves the problem to another level. The root issue here is fragmentation. The root issue is um, everybody off on their own trying to figure out their own problem in isolation. Mm -hmm. And inside most organizations, you will have um, a series of business departments HR, finance, a whole list of them. And they will all come to IT and say, you must do X because we're the business and the business tells IT what to do. But from an IT perspective, what happens is you get all of these fragmented and um, groups that while they have an accurate, accurate view of their world, it's only their world. It's not the organization. Mm -hmm. And so they're a part of the business, but it's all of these groups together that really is the business and not just the business areas together, but also the IT department to have that holistic view. And so I'm much more of a proponent inside organizations of creating um, good service delivery areas around capabilities. And one of them should be around IT. Um, we should try and build um, uh, really good um, enterprise facing customer centric um, IT groups in order to satisfy the needs where people don't feel they have to do these things on their own. And I'll give you one example of this. It doesn't seem so much like IT, but even if you centralized all of your technology to one place, who manages uh, user access to that? And in a lot of organizations, it's the business area. So there'll be an HR uh, system, a payroll system, and they'll say, we'll decide who and how has access. What you get is a whole fragmented approach, sometimes really good, sometimes really uh, immature and um, low capability um, around who has access to things. A better approach is to create a small team in a large organization, four to six people, and they try and figure out one standard way that as a, an entire enterprise, we assess 
who should have access to what systems. Now you have to fine tune those for each of the business areas, but now you've got one place that can look across the whole organization and have a standard way of mm. provisioning access and tracking it. And when auditors come in, being able to give assurance that that person, when they left the organization or changed departments, lost that access and gained that access, as opposed to letting dozens of individual business units try and figure out who should have access to things on their own. So that's one of those things. It's not really seen technical in the business areas will say, <clears throat> but we're the business, we decide those things. But actually it's a core capability that you could centralize. Mm. And it, I think it should be within um, the, the CIO's remit and around a modern IT function to do those things that aren't seen as technical, but they're actually just mm. as critical, especially from a cybersecurity perspective. Yeah, so a, um, you're saying a, a dedicated team specifically to own that as a, as a mm. service within the organization. So, and would yeah, they be responsible? Yeah, that's one idea for, around, you know, yeah. you know and a large that organization, involve, which, yeah, yeah, and yeah I, I like it. Yeah, yeah it so sense. you're using that as, a, as a, a proxy for the, the group of people who would be responsible for cybersecurity? No, but it's more about um, Jason's comment around um, um, distributed computing or um, shadow IT to really yes. just show that, um, you know, people think, well, I can go and buy my own SaaS product and do what I need in my parts of the organization, but we have to have a more holistic view of that. And um, it's, it's just another problem now at a different level in the same way that everyone buying whatever PC um, tickled their fancy yes. before created a whole lot of um, risk and quite frankly, um, added a lot of expensive overhead. So the, the, and I can see how that makes a lot of sense. Um, but, but I mean, obviously the, 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 the need to address uh, security across an organization can't really be constructed in the same way, can it? Well, um, some parts of it can be and should be. Mm -hmm. So um, here's another, uh, there's a difference of opinion out there on this, but um, one of the case studies I love to point to is Equifax, the big, um, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's actually global, but there was a big Equifax breach several years ago. And it's a really interesting read of the findings. And one of the findings they had was that the chief information security officer did not report to the chief information officer. Now, a lot of people say well, they shouldn't okay. and they should report to the board. But actually, um, I don't think so. Be and, and the Equifax things pointed that out because the CISO and his team came up with a whole set of rules like patch zero day exploits within 24 hours, patching must be done within 48 hours, all these things. It's a great, the assurance to the board would have been wonderful based on those reports. But the practicality of it is it wasn't okay. getting done. Yeah, it wasn't getting done. Yeah. And yeah. you've got two peers now that are necessary, yeah. perhaps at odds. So I think it's much better to have one senior executive that, that's the throat to choke to make things happen. Where do you draw the line for that? And then you make sure it works down below. And that's sort of the backdrop to answer your, your question, Paul, around I've always liked to have the IT function that reports to me and the various directors there somewhat separate from the CISO function that also reports to me with cybersecurity. And I, I kind of want those teams working hand in hand mm. on things. I don't want it adversarial, adversary, yeah. but I do want um, sort of the independent checks and balances that can assure me that the things the teams are doing around taking care of cybersecurity as part of their core activities in running IT are being done. And that's really the nux of your question. Every single person in IT should be thinking and breathing and dreaming about security. So if somebody runs an SQL database, they should know everything there is about the version we're running, the patch, the, you know, patch levels you can do, what features break, uh, and where, you know, where um, there's a vulnerability you should patch. And that person should be doing the cybersecurity in that area. And then the cybersecurity function can be a check and balance to make sure that, that that's occurring. And often that's not the case. A, a lot of times you have an IT group that's not very good necessarily at working together holistically and therefore not very good at cybersecurity. A new cyber team comes in and they start barking orders about things. And then yeah. the group there doesn't feel empowered. They feel spoken to and told what to do. Therefore, they don't bother you know, lifting up their own bootstraps and trying to do it. And you see, sort of get this bad culture developing. So I think it's better to get the IT people to think about their domain and, and security 
and then and then get the separate cybersecurity team to uh, to work with them where they need to, and then to provide that assurance as well. So, in, in a practical sense, how how do you how do you check? Because that's a culture thing as much as anything mm. else, isn't it? It's it's about getting people to adopt a more collaborative approach to this really critical area of, uh, of, of, of business. How do you create that kind of collaborative culture which removes the kind of um, you know, servant master relationship that can develop between those who are setting the, the rules and those who are being asked to adopt the rules? Yeah, look, um, it's a tough one and there's lots of different approaches to use. I'll maybe just start off with a couple high level ideas. Um, one of them is the great Harvard, art, uh, Harvard uh, Business Review article I read years ago that said to change culture, you really need seven years. Now, whether it's seven or nine or five, is, I think beside the point, the issue is it takes a lot longer than executives coming in for two years saying, I transformed the place. My observations of that typically is somebody whips in, they're very charismatic, they talk a good talk, they get everyone excited, but the rubber hits the road, the, the meat and potatoes that needs to get sorted doesn't. People just have a good feeling. They leave because look at what I did and so they go off to the next gig and nothing's fundamentally changed. It's more like painting over plaster or painting over drywall. It looks good for a bit, but pretty soon yeah. the cracks are gonna come back out. So I think the first thing is realizing it's a tough slog and you got to start somewhere and then you've got to stick through it. But mm. part of it is, is getting people to um, believe in themselves and start to believe over a period of months and unfortunately in some cases years that um, they aren't supposed to just sit there and wait for an order anymore, that they actually should be um, speaking up when they have an idea and give it a try. And then there's a larger cultural issue there where, you know, that quiet person who's, who's spoken up and said, you know, this has always been an issue, we should fix it, and then fixes it, and then the organize, and, and it goes badly, and then the organization or the boss or his colleagues say, you screwed that up. So how you react to failure, not just once or twice, but over the long haul, mm -hmm. is a really important thing to help um, switch, switch that dial. Um, yeah. and, I'm probably not giving you very many specifics here, but I just I just want to share a story probably from 10 years ago now um, about trying to change culture and how important it is to just keep repeating yourself, stay on the same messages, and don't get discouraged when people and the team doesn't move fast enough. I'd been in a job for uh, about 18 months. I think it was actually getting close to over 20 months. And I had um, weekly all supervisors meeting. So all four or five levels of everyone who reported under me every week to try and really influence the culture. And there was a particular book and there were particular phrases in that book that I spoke about all the time. And I, and I, and I often held it up in the meeting. I had slides about it. So about 20 months in, one of the managers, um, one level down from me, came into my office all excited and he says, Trevor, I just bought this book. I think you'd really like it. It talks about X. And I, and it was exactly what I've been talking about. Uh, I thought, <laughs> my goodness, where have you been the last, you know, almost two years now? And I remember thinking my whole spirit sunk. And I thought, wait a second. And I, I reversed it and I put my arm around his shoulder and I said, thank you so much. I'm so excited to read this. It sounds like a great idea. <laughs> now, somebody could say to me, why didn't you say to him, I've been talking about this and point it out, but, but that actually would have done more harm. It would have sort of, yes, felt, not everyone's a fast learner. Some are really, no. really slow, but your organization can only go as fast as everyone in it is moving. And, and um, so I know I probably gave you more of a general answer to that, but I think we underestimate how important um, culture is and what is culture is just a set of behaviors that um, people generally exhibit and so it's paying attention to getting those behaviors to change to the ones that you want over time and not giving up even when people tell you we're tired of hearing about that same behavioral thing because chances are they haven't internalized it yet and they're not applying sure. it in their day-to-day -day work yeah yeah um, so, so one of the other topics that um, I know you are uh, personally very vociferous about on social media um, is the need for better personal data privacy. 
and, and people taking responsibility for that. So I don't know how many people you've got on campus. Um, well, you probably haven't got that many people on campus <laughs> at the moment. But no. when the university is functioning fully, you've, you've got thousands of people on campus. How, how do you get people to adopt that, that whole kind of mantra of you've got to take responsibility for your own privacy? I'm not here to protect you 24 hours a day. Yeah, it's an uphill battle, and we're probably at the very early stages of, um, you know, trying to have have that in, impact. Excuse me. Um, I guess trying to trying to hit people where they are is the is the key thing to think about things. So, in particular, if somebody's got a job and they're sharing out um, spreadsheets, usually over email with salary data or or something, it's when you come across those things. Helping, keep helping them realize why that's a bad idea and offering an alternative solution. And you know how you approach that then means that that person um, not only will necessarily change their behavior, but also maybe talk to others about the kinds of things that they've learned and, and, and it sort of moves slowly over time. But the whole issue of data privacy, I think um, most people, even those in the industry, don't fully understand just how bad it is just how much um, how many companies how many governments have access to all sorts of data that you'd never think that they had access to and I, I think a good rule of thumb that and it's not a stretch it's true if you've ever said something electronically or on the internet it's never gone backups mm -hmm. are never really erased that's yep. that's the way you, you should live um, any email you've ever written, any website you've ever gone to, there's a record somewhere of that. Um, now, it might freak a lot of people out, but you can't change the past. So you might just want to think about what you're doing in the future. Um, but And how much of that data is pulled together and, and aggregated um, uh, around things. And I think, you know, there, there's a big debate here a few years ago in Australia around um, medical health records mm. and uh, you know there's one on the one hand it's very convenient and it's good from a health perspective to sharing the data but on the other hand you've got all of your data now sitting in one place and if that could get gets compromised um, it's all over Red Rover and it only takes one weakness um, to do that interestingly um, I've, I've learned in the last six months that there are parts of uh, Australia, whether it's um, state or other elections, that where there's some online voting, and uh, I've thought a lot about this over the years. And it, online voting is sort of convenient, but um, if it's electronic, if it's technology, it can be compromised. It can be hacked. Um, and uh, you know, I don't think we can ever go back to these days. But you know, in countries where they have poor infrastructure or there's recently been a change to democracy, you dip your finger in purple ink and you know one person, mm -hmm. one vote. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're probably not going to do that, but that's really the, the best way that you know you can, you, can um, you know, whether people can vote again. And, you know, the other thing, this was interesting in the U.S. elections around, uh, around voting, um, it's become much more electronic at the local level. And, and mm. where that happens, you have the opportunity to commit fraud more at scale. So while fraud could be committed on paper with paper ballots, when you look at an entire country, you have to have a pretty large conspiracy mm. in order to affect change there. But when you start moving to things electronic, and we talk about really fast computers and AI, you don't take, yeah. it doesn't take much to tamper with that. And for the average person, who doesn't sort of see under the covers with technology to understand that. It sounds like science fiction, but these are sort of the issues um, that I think need to get discussed a lot more around where is our data, how is it protected, who has access to it, and, uh, you know, wh why, you know, nothing is free. There's no free no. money. Someone always pays. If someone offers you a free service, you probably yeah. shouldn't use it, really, because it means they're using you and your data. Um, just on that, in terms of elections and voting, um, there's a lot of conversation around the use of blockchain technology as a way of, you know, mitigating those risks. Do you think that's a? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a there's a, a quote that I think um, applies so much, and it applies probably to blockchain. Um, we 
overestimate in the short term the impact of something and underestimate mm -hmm. the long term. Uh, someone on Twitter I saw recently had a had an article from the 90s about how the internet would be a fad and it right. would fizzle out. You know, and people talk to me about the dot com boom in you know uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, what people don't realize is, yeah, there was there the, sort of the, the bubble burst, the dot com boom, and then the bubble burst. But but the bubble burst, and then it kept going. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so around crypto uh, um, cryptocurrencies or um, uh, you know blockchains and all the rest of it, I think um, there's a lot there's a lot that it will do for the world um, around if it's used around freedom and democracy and and uh, and decentralizing things. Um, we know that decentral. So contrary to what I said earlier in the show about centralized technology, actually decentralization in many cases is what we should be looking for in a free and open society, and we should be looking for around um, various technology things and instead of one big central database as well. Um, but I think the impact that that's going to have on the world is um, is bigger than we think. And, you know, people I, I, I saw recently, they criticized blockchain or Ethereum, and, and I know those are cryptocurrencies, but, um, sorry, um, uh, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum that mm -hmm. you sort of have the blockchain idea. But those things have evolved. Those, those the underlying technology that has, has, um, mm -hmm. has changed, different features have come in. So... I think one of the things with all of this, Jason, is to, is to think about not where things are today, but where they're going to be and where the trend line is going. And in particular around um, blockchain, looking at what is happening in the, in the world, um, the geopolitics and other things in, in conjunction with, um, with that. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Fascinating. So... Um we need to wrap up, Trevor. Um, any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, because I think everything you've been talking about has really been focused on the execution of, um, you know, preventing cyber attacks and arming ourselves and being prepared and having the right structures in place. Um, anything you'd like to say in terms of, uh, you know, your, your top two or three things that are going to help our audience grasp some of the concepts here and move forward? Yeah, maybe um, a couple of, of, of principles that perhaps I've touched on a little bit already. But um, I mean, from an organizational point of view and a cultural point of view and, and where you need your capabilities to be, um, I think uh, skating to where the puck is going to be to steal, steal an ice hockey uh, okay, analogy okay. from... Uh, <laughs> What Maybe do you win. expect? Yeah, um, as a good old Canadian, uh, yeah. although I have my Aussie citizenship, by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> and I'll use an example for this. When, we, when organizations look at cloud, um, oftentimes they are further from where they want to be with it. And so I think drawing a hard line, like saying, we will be a SaaS-only organization or a software-as-a-service-only strategy not everything you need to do in an organization is available that way, but it, what it does is it sets a target that over a period of years, you will try and adjust the capabilities, the skill sets in IT and the organization to get there. Um, and it's sort of that idea that, um, you know, we overestimate what can be done in the short term. You can't all of a sudden be cloud only, but over the long term, um, you need to be building the core capabilities and activities to, to sort of move um, where you need to be. That analogy could also be used in your personal life. So from a, a, a personal privacy or, or IT security perspective, um, most of us have hundreds uh, or a hundred or more accounts that we probably share the same password with it and we don't have multi-factor authentication on most of it and you know we haven't gone through the privacy settings. You, you know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Every day or maybe every Saturday morning, you just do one or two <laughs> and you move along. Well, I've been personally uh, here, Trevor, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am. I, I've been, I've, I've, I've finally got in the last year much more um, um, committed to that. And, you know, I've, I think I have 600 um, accounts or something. My Apple password manager tells me. I don't even know what they're all for. 
but it tells me that I've reused the password a long time. <laughs> it also tells me that it's, some of these passwords have been compromised. But you can't just sort of sit down and fix it all at once. So I just, the reason I'm saying this is because it's not one of those things that you'll ever fix and stop doing. It actually builds in a bit of a routine where you're, you're thinking every week or every fortnight, how am I looking from a personal security perspective? What websites do I go to? What are my settings? Um, I've been trying to untangle myself from, from Gmail. Um, yes. I remember when my kids were born and they're all in their 20s now. Um, as soon as I could, I, I got them on the, on the uh, referral list for a, a Gmail account. Uh, as soon as they were born, so boom, they had it and they didn't use it for years later. But when, my point is when you entangled your entire life for a decade or two in a technology like uh, Gmail or Google, it takes a lot to get out of that. And I've switched to things like Proton Mail, and it's trying to move, slowly move over to it. And I pay for that service because I trust that it's more secure, not being data mined like Google. And so I guess my tip, Paul, is, you know, with thinking about these things, um, what matters is action, rubber hitting the road. It's the same mm. thing like the Equifax stuff. You can have great ideas and great policies, but the actions is what matters. And just taking that time to be disciplined and stay at it is really what we're gonna to need to do to live in a modern world and stay secure and protect our privacy. That's, that's great advice, Trevor. And I do, I do think a lot, we're, particularly with this, this area of cybersecurity, there is a temptation to kind of sit back and observe and try to rationalize and then not do anything. Mm. And if you're not doing anything, you haven't moved forward. All you've done is acquired a little bit more knowledge. Well, that's great. But you've got to take, and it is a personal responsibility thing. At the end of the day, um, this is too big a threat for any one organization to be able to, to say, we've got the silver bullet, just install this, off you go. It's going to be, yeah. uh, it's going to be a colossal effort for all of us to start taking personal responsibility, work out what we can do to minimize mm. the threats to us, and, and start doing stuff. Because if we're not doing it, it ain't going to change. Yeah. We need nope. to understand that we live in a digital world, and if we want to do that, we have to be yep. responsible for that and yep. take what comes with the territory. So, Shavad, thank you very much, mate. That was awesome. One last um, thing. Hang on. Jason yeah. always has a last question, <laughs> which um, I never, I never <laughs> let him do it. But anyway, um, carry on. No, no. Yeah. What's, uh, just wondering if you wanted to share the name of that book that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Oh. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> We'll put it in the notes for the podcast. Don't worry. Yeah, no uh, problem. Uh, it's it's one of two different books. I it it could have been Good to Great by Jim Collins. Oh, yeah. No, it will. Um, Great book. Yeah, uh, or it could have been The Contrarian's Guide to Leadership, which was written okay. by an ex vice chancellor president of uh, I think it was Stanford University, um, uh, California. Yeah. Uh, both both good books. Yeah, off okay. the top of my head, I think it was yeah. one of those. We'll, they we'll, both have uh, a red we'll, cover. And well, we'll put them it. both in the uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll put them both in the podcast notes for me. Anyway, that's great. Thank you very much indeed, Trevor. Have a great day, and uh, we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Thanks a lot, mate. Take take care, take care yeah. now. Okay.